Okay, welcome to the next Complete Physio podcast. Uh, we're talking about ACLs today, so that's the anterior cruciate ligament, and we're joined by a consultant orthopedic surgeon, Mr. Martin Goddard, who uh, we've worked with for many years at Complete, and also Mike Brent, who's a highly specialised physio at Complete, who sees lots of ACL uh, reconstructions and rehabilitates lots of uh, ACL injuries. Now, what's unique about this setup is that Martin also uh, operated on Mike's uh, knee and did an ACL reconstruction. So not only are you going to get their expertise, you're also going to hear from somebody who's also had an ACL problem. And I've also found out that Martin's already had an ACL reconstruction. So lots of experience in the room. I've never had an ACL reconstruction. I have both my native ACLs. So without further ado, Martin, if you could just introduce yourself and give us an idea of where you work and what you do. So I'm Martin Goddard. I'm a consultant knee surgeon, uh, mainly based at Parkside Hospital in Wimbledon. And one of my specialties is ACL injury and ACL reconstruction, as well as reconstructing patients who've already had their ACL reconstructed and they've managed to do it again when they've gone back to sport. Perfect. And Mike? Yeah, I'm Mike. I work at Complete Physio. I work across two clinics, one in England, one in Swiss Cottage. Um, do a lot of ACL rehab and I also specialise in shoulder rehab. Perfect. Now, the idea of this podcast is if, if you're watching this at home and you've injured your ACL, hopefully you get a lot more information by the end of this podcast than you had at the beginning. Um, and wherever you're being treated, hopefully you've got a few questions as well to ask your surgeon or ask your physio. So, Let's start at the beginning. We'll start with you, Martin. How do you, well, first of all, what is the ACL? So in the knee are four ligaments and the ACL is the main ligament right in the center of the knee that we all use when we're playing sports that involve twisting, cutting, jumping or landing. So straight line activities, running, swimming, skiing, we don't use our ACL. But anything involving changes of direction, the ACL stops the knee twisting. So it's a really, really important ligament. So it's a really important ligament in the knee, particularly related to that rotational stability. Perfect. Um, and Mike, uh, let's start with you. How did you injure your ACL? Uh, playing rugby, or tag rugby actually. So just a quick change It's a pretty direction. dangerous game tag rugby, isn't it? <laughs> You'll be surprised. And ultimate frisbee. Those are the, the big two that I find. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just a quick sun change direction. Again, yeah. like a lot of ACLs, non-contact. Um, just stopped, pivoted, went to go, and then kind of immediately knew. I'd, Did you I'd hear a, it. a pop? I didn't Did hear a pop, but I just felt a bit of a bit of a clunk. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So Perfect. I pretty much knew. Cool. So Martin, how do most people injure their ACL? That sounds like a fairly classic sort of injury mechanism. Yeah, I mean, you know, Mike's given the the classic story. So it's normally with a team ball sport. Um, because those are the sports that are landing jumping. Um, worldwide, the commonest sport is netball. Uh, in the UK, the commonest sport is soccer, uh, followed by rugby. Um, and then in this area, we see a lot of skiers who do it. Um, and that's when the ski edge catches uh, in the snow, and then it's a huge lever arm um, across the knee, twisting it. Um, it's normally non-contact, um, as Mike says, um, and it's a big injury. Um, you're in no doubt that you've done it, um, you know, when you've had that episode. Yeah. Um, I managed to do mine skiing I was uh, when the ski yeah. uh, caught an edge and it, it just flicked out to the side um, and the torque across the knee, it, it just went. And you knew, obviously. I, I knew I'd pop? No, I, I no. knew I'd had a, a, a significant injury, but I managed to carry on skiing for the week and I was a year one doctor. Um, not that knowledgeable about the ACL at that stage, and I was a bit of a delayed diagnosis. Right. Mm, interesting. I see quite a few of them though. Hundred percent. See people one, two years post, say my knee just hasn't felt normal for two yeah. years and have no idea. Um, yeah, yeah. You it's definitely to see diagnose, that. though when they're a bit more chronic than when they're acute. Yeah, yeah. A bit looser. Mm. And is there, Martin? To you, is there any? So you've talked about the sports that put you at risk. Is there other groups? Obviously, we've talked like. Females are more at risk. Are there any other groups that are more prone to doing an, an ACL? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so females are between four and five times more at risk than males. Right. Um, we don't really understand why. Uh, it could be a hormonal influence. Um, it could be the lower limb angle, so the angle between the hip and the knee or the knee and the ankle. Um, it could be the shape of the knee, mm. so smaller 
notches or the center of the knee, uh, maybe associated with smaller ACLs, different angle of the ACL. Yeah. Um, the other group is family history. Right. So it certainly runs in families, um, although the genetics are um, poorly understood. Yeah. Um, and then the other one would be patients with other collagen problems. Right, so, so like hypermobile. Yeah, so, you know, generalised joint laxities where, you know, the collagen's different and because, you know, collagen's the main constitution of a ligament, mm. that may predispose it. So those people have got a little bit more elasticity mm. to their ligaments. Mm. And Probably suppose, trickier to treat as well. Yeah, because, you know, the way we do it, using, you know, a graft off the patient, that graft is likely to have a collagen deficit as well. Yeah. And I guess the other ones are people who've done it once already. Yeah, yeah. So if you've already shown you're good at doing it, then you're going to be fairly good at doing the other side yeah, yeah. or good at doing the one you've already had fixed up. And it's not uncommon to do both, is it? It's not uncommon to do both. When, when did you? Well, when was your first one? Um, about seven or eight years ago. So that was a partial ACL, complete PCL. Um, that was a rugby. That was a contact injury, though, rather than being non-contact. yeah. yeah. So, but you didn't have that. That was yeah. partial ACL. So yeah, no, I treated right. conservatively, braced for the PCL, and it's yeah, yeah. been pretty much perfect since. So. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about now. We talk about the mechanism. So it's that classic sort of pivot. Most people hear a pop. Both of you didn't hear a pop. Do you do you find that with your patients? I think the research looking at stuff like this says there's about an eighty percent chance you'll hear yeah, a pop. Yeah, I've heard that one. It's yeah. kind of you know a good idea to ask patients, did you hear a pop? Yeah. But I don't think it means either way. No. Um, you know, so many knees, you know, click from the patellofemoral joint, which is almost a normal finding that, you know, it's hard to piece that together as hard evidence. But, you know, it's a good question for, you know, doctors, physios, yeah. medical students, A&E nurses to ask, you know, well, did it pop on you? Yeah. And if you, yeah, exactly. As you say, there's so many different reasons a knee can pop. Mm -hmm. But... We'd certainly all agree that getting an early diagnosis as soon as possible is absolutely key because, as you've alluded to, this is actually a very significant injury that long term can cause you know, lots of problems, can't it? So getting an early diagnosis is really important. It's really, really important, only, not only to, to set off the treatment pathway, because as we'll talk about, it's a, it's a big injury to get over in terms of time yeah. and the sooner that treatment begins the, the quicker these younger patients can get back to whatever they're doing but if it's if it's not diagnosed and they've got an unstable knee then the risk is damaging other things in the knee yeah. which then have bigger consequences yeah. long term with you know other diseases and um, the main one being arthritis sure so you said the term unstable can you just clear up what you mean by that yeah so there's there's two things that um, often get used interchangeably. So functional instability is when patients describe their knee giving way. Um, and that can be with daily activities, um, stepping off a curb or moving around in crowded places like the tube. And as they twist and turn, they'll just feel the knee either fully give way or try to give way on them. So those are the symptoms the patients describe. Um, laxity is something clinicians, physicians, physiotherapists assess in the clinic. And what that means is how loose the knee is compared to the uninjured knee. Uh, and the two don't necessarily mean the same thing. Sure, yeah. yeah. So really one is what you feel as a clinician and the other is what the patient is That's exactly talk, right. talking about. And, and we know that if a knee keeps giving way, you're, you're essentially damaging the knee, would we say, every time that yeah, happens? Yeah, that's right. So every time the knee is pivoting out, the, the joint surfaces are grinding against each other, you know, much like a pestle and mortar. Um, and the menisci, which are the shock absorbers that sit between the joints, they're hugely at risk of, um, of getting damaged. Yeah. Um, there is some research which looked at patients who had injured their ACLs and they had normal menisci at the time of injury on the scan. And the research showed that five months afterwards, without ACL reconstruction to stabilize the knee, in patients with functional instability, the menisci then got torn. Yeah. So it's a sure. pretty good landmark that, that if you've got functional instability, it's a good idea to try and get the surgery to stabilize the knee within five months. Within the first five months. Yeah. That's really interesting. And obviously that's often in your 20 year olds, 30 year olds. So you can imagine by the time, if they've had that for a long period of time, that's when you can also then not just damage your meniscus, but damage the, the articular surfaces of the joint as well. And why you might 
potentially get arthritis. That's right. But we'll come on to that. So, Mike, what's if you've got a patient in clinic and they think, well, I've injured my knee, I've done this, I've my foot was here and I've pivoted in, didn't hear a pop, what would be the classic things, the signs and symptoms that you would see in clinic that would make you suspicious? Sure. And there are obviously then what would you do and, and sure. how would we get that information? Sure. I mean, the mechanism is a big one, which you said yeah. already, that's really important. Um, and then the things you'll see often, there's quite a bit of swelling, you know, with the complete ACL, you'll quite often see some quite acute swelling around the knee, mm. which is quite, not all the time though, because sometimes it isn't, but often you'll see quite a bit of swelling in there. Um, often find signs and symptoms they find difficult to go to end of range whether it's kind of straightening the knee fully or trying to bend their knee fully they quite often find that quite difficult yeah. um, whether it's due to the swelling or as we said the tibia not being as, as stable as it should be so they struggle with that they often say their knee just feels different and just feels odd um, yeah. and wh whether that's kind of going downstairs is a classic one they say it just doesn't feel comfortable going downstairs it's a problem um, occasionally weight bearing could be a problem especially straight after the injury I don't know if you felt it Martin you did yours but I struggled to get up initially and then weight bearing was a little bit of a difficulty yeah. then 10 minutes in it gets a little bit quicker so all those signs are quite quite classic of the ACL yeah, yeah. I suppose it also depends we'll come on to this in a minute but you often you do an ACL injury with other things as, yeah which as is what I was going to say said earlier absolutely if you've already got those other side effects from the ACL which most people do then it's going to be even more of a yeah. problem if you don't get it sorted if you are having these episodes yeah. of the knee slipping and yeah. having issues. And then obviously you do your clinical assessment, yeah. uh, but to be honest, if you've had that mechanism, mm -hmm. you're you're normally suspicious enough already, Absolutely. aren't you, as a physio? Yeah. And then I'm sure we'll go on to some of the testing things we can do later and some of the tests to look at this laxity, but often when it's really acute, it's quite hard to tell anyway, because yeah. they get muscle guarding, so you get really high tone, you have a lot of swelling, so we give you false positives, false negatives. Mm. So it could be quite hard if it's really acute within the first week or so. Yeah. Um, Anything to add on, on that, Martin? No, I think some of those things uh, are really are really key things to, to ask patients when they've done it. The swelling's really important. Yeah. So most of them, it swells up straight away. Um, and that's different to things like isolated meniscal tears, where the swelling tends to happen several hours later or the next day. Mm -hmm. So it's that immediate swelling. And the reason for that is the ACL has a very, very rich blood supply. And if you're going to tear that thing, it obviously bleeds. And the swelling is actually bleeding coming from the ACL. Um, another one is um, unable to play on after the injury. Yeah. Something about you, like when yeah. you went down. Like um, I struggled to stand. Yeah, it's really, really, really unusual yeah. that people can carry on playing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's another one before you've even laid a finger on them um, to ask, you know, well, did you carry on? And, you know, they often say, well, you know, not in a million years. No. On YouTube, if you put in Paul Gascoigne ACL injury, you, I can't remember how old you are, Martin. <laughs> You're a bit younger, I think, Mike. But yeah, you put it in and you see him do it. Yeah. And then you I'm see him really, sorry, you see him trying to get up and you can just see he's just not comfortable. He does yeah. play on yeah. for a few minutes, yeah, and I mean, then he just goes yeah. down and goes Yeah, yeah. the other one's Michael Owen when he did his, and he's That's sort of there holding his leg. Yeah. And yeah. And I think, I think this is really worth mentioning, is that, and it'd be interesting what you guys think, but sometimes patients don't think they've done anything too serious because they're not in agony. Yeah, I had no pain at all. There you I go. never had yeah. pain at all from the moment I did it to when I came to see Martin. I never had pain, mm. but it just felt weird. And I had one actually last week, Exactly the same. She said, twisted my knee, I think it's a sprain because it's not painful. Um, and she's she just had her results back. She's got a complete yeah. with a couple of other things yeah. going on. So. so the message there really is, if you think you've done a big injury and it doesn't feel right, you've still got to get it checked out. Even Because it's a bit like an Achilles rupture. Often they're not that painful, but mm -hmm. it's still a serious injury that needs, that needs a good diagnosis. So Martin, being the diagnostician here, <laughs> That's a word. I'm sure it is. Um, how do you diagnose an MRI scan? Well, so, so diagnosing the ACL. 90, oh, sorry, diagnose it. 90, how do you diagnose an ACL? 99% right. of it's on the history. Right. Um, the, and then the clinical exam. So um, just going back to what you said, anybody with a sporting injury and a knee that swells up straight away needs to get it looked at. So it's as simple as that for, yeah. you know, who needs it looks. Don't at. overthink it and, and then you, and then, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then you're going to, you know, not be in a situation where 
you know, it gets missed. Um, so the history is really important. Um, the next bit's the clinical exam yeah. um, and standard things like, you know, big swollen knee, um, a stiff knee, you know, they're all signs that, you know, something's happened inside that joint. Uh, but the main clinical test we use is something called the Lachman test. Um, and that we compare to the normal Do you want to leg. explain what the ACL does and how that Lachman yeah, test Yeah, so, so if this is a tibia or a shin and this is the femur and the knee joint is in the centre of my hands, the ACL stops the tibia moving forwards. So the joint should be lined up and without an ACL in place, the tibia will move further forwards than it should do. Um, so what we do with a Lachman test, we just replicate that movement. So one arm holds the femur or the thigh, the other holds the shin, and then we pull forwards and we're looking for how much um, the tibia moves forwards um, and then what sort of end point it has. Um, does it firmly stop at its end movement or is it a soft end point that suggests yeah. a rupture? Um, and it's a, it's a good test. It has um, a very high sensitivity and specificity. Um, as Mike said, it's challenging to do acutely uh, because the patients are guarding because it's sore. Um, and it's a good reason to look at the good leg first uh, because you just gain their trust with what you're going to do and you know they realise it's all, all pretty gentle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but normally with the history and the, and the Lapman, we can work it out. And then the MRI scan is really confirmation and to look for associated injury. Yeah. So 50% of people will damage something else other than the ACL in there. Um, and that most commonly is the, the meniscus. Um, next commonest would be um, the joint surface um, and then other ligament injuries. Um, and the reason for that is it's, in, it's important to counsel patients mm. um, as to you know, how many things on their injury list they've got, because that has an effect on the outcome. Right. So the more things you've damaged, uh, the harder it is afterwards to get back to um, your, your pre-injury level. Yeah. Um, and, and the more likely, you know, in a decade's time, you, you know, you might have some problems yeah, in yeah. that joint. So if somebody's watching this now and they've got their MRI scan in front of them, um, so they're either going to, they can have an ACL rupture. Do you just want to go through the sort of terms that they might see on that report in terms of how that relates to those different injuries? So there's lots <laughs> and lots of um, interchangeable um, in terms. So a complete rupture or a complete tear means that every single fibre of the ACL is being cut across. Mm -hmm. So there's no connection between um, the two ends of the ACL. Um, and that's by far the commonest injury to do if you're going to do an ACL So if rupture. the ACL is in there, this is literally... Yeah, you're taking a pair of scissors yeah. to it and, yeah, and yeah. both sides have completely gone. Um, the ACL is actually made up inside the knee of two parts. So it's got two bundles to it. Um, so, you know, much like my fingers and those two bundles wrap around each other. And it is possible to have a single bundle ACL rupture where only one of them goes and the other one's okay. Um, so, so that might what you be would call a partial. So that would that's, be a partial. That's what I was diagnosed with in my first. Mm. Right. Okay. One, one portion anterior portion had gone. Mm. Yeah. And then the other ones are the sprains, which are really, really rare. Um, we sometimes see those in adolescents um, or pediatric patients, and um, that's when the the fibres are just stretched, but they're not stretched enough that any of the fibres actually tear, and right. then it just goes back. Um, to its normal length yeah. so it's not ruptured at all but you can see on the scan that you know it's had a force across it and there's edema or swelling inside sure. the fibers yeah we'll come on to management and we'll talk about how we manage those uh different um those those whether it's partial whether it's complete or as you say whether it's sprained but also tell us a little bit about the other structures so the you know the mcl medial meniscus is it more common to injure your medial lateral meniscus what, yeah, what, what are the other combinations that you can get and and is that important I suppose so it, it's got a little bit of relevance to your chosen sport right so skiers for example it's very unusual just to tear your ACL most skiing injuries will involve an MCL sprain as well right. and the MCL or the medial ligament is the big ligament on the on the inside of the knee um, and that's just in relation to the to the way the forces go with the ski as the as the knee twists. Um, so that would be the next commonest uh, combination. Yeah. So isolated ACL is commonest, then it would be ACL and an MCL sprain, and then we start involving the menisci. Mm. So the menisci, there's two of them. There's one on the inside of the joint called the medial, and there's one on the outside called the lateral. And it's commonest to tear the lateral when you do your ACL. 
right, yeah. um, and with that you can have really significant injuries of the lateral meniscus. Yeah. Um, there's something called a lateral meniscal root tear, yeah. uh, which is where the meniscus is anchored down onto the bone. You can actually damage that attachment, and um, you know that's a serious injury as well as the as well as the yeah. ACL. And so, as a general rule, you're you know if you've got an MRI scan that says you've just ruptured your ACL. That's the sort of best case scenario than obviously not injuring the other structures as well. Do they do better? Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, in order of preference, you'd want yeah. an ACL What's sprain. Your best? Yeah. If you want an ACL sprain, then you'd want a, a Mike Brent of a partial. Yeah. So a single bundle yeah. injury. Um, then you would want just an ACL, and then we start entering you know the problems when when you start getting multiple things yeah. um, adding up. And it gets quite complicated, doesn't it, in terms of it priorities does. of treatment? Yeah, I mean, sort of you know, in terms of um, future problems in the knee or consequences of having had this big injury, if you just have an isolated ACL and everything is normal, your outlook for 20 years later in terms of the condition of your knee is better than if you've torn both menisci yeah. at the same time. And, you know, what I'm really talking about is the, the development of arthritis, um, which would be pain and swelling with, with sports or, or increasing activity. And we'll come on to that when we talk about to reconstruct or not. Mm. I think that'd be an interesting one. So Mike, somebody's sitting at home, they've their knee's blown up. So what would you advise as the immediate management if somebody has literally got off the football pitch? Is there anything they should or shouldn't be doing? Sure. So obviously you want to try and get on top of that swelling uh, as much as possible. And we want to just normalize the knee. So obviously we're not expecting it to go back into sport quickly, mm -hmm. but really want to store as much kind of range of movement in the knee as possible. We want to get the muscles to fire up as quickly as possible to protect the knee. Yeah. Um, and then just get on top of that swelling. So you yeah. just want to get the normal back in, into a comfortable state. Yeah. Um, to Can make you, sure do you need can... to, where, would you advise crutches if they've, Let's say they've just come off. Is it something they should be on crutches for or can they walk around? They can walk around normally, but it all depends on how they're walking, mm. right? You know, if they're starting to limp and they can't walk comfortably with a good gait pattern and they're starting to twist or do something weird, then yeah. they may create a problem later. If they can walk with a pretty comfortable, normal gait, then there's not so much of a need to do so. Yeah, perfect. Let's just say, Martin, from again, from a diagnostic point of view, if they've come off the football, pe off football pitch, often people will say, should they go and get an x-ray? Because it's not easy just to go and get an MRI, is it? Particularly on the NHS. But should they go to A and E? Should they get an X ray? What's your thoughts around that? Yeah, so so, so I think they probably should go to A and E. Yeah. Um, the X ray adds little value, um, as we've said. It's you know the history, the clinical exam, and then confirmation with an MRI. Um, there is something called a second fracture, mm. uh, named after a French surgeon who identified. It's always a, French surgeons. It's always French surgeons who nice. identified yeah, nice. um, a little chip of bone that can come off the lateral side of the knee. That if you've got that, there's an eighty percent chance you've you've done the ACL. Mm. So it's a good thing to look out for if you you know get an X-ray and you see a, a report that says second fracture. Mm. You know it probably means you've you've done your ACL. Uh, but I think the A&E is, is a good thing to go to. Um, you know, it gets you into the hospital system, um, depending on your mechanism. If you you know, think you may have had a fracture, the x-ray is helpful, but it, it's not really on the list for an ACL. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we wouldn't order it. You know, when I see a patient who's no. got an ACL story, they go straight for the MRI. Go straight for the MRI. But I think you've made a really good point there that you know, if somebody can't go to a private practitioner or, or don't have private health care, then... At least in A&E, it may be a route into fracture clinic or to mm. see an orthopaedic consultant, which is where you may then get an MRI. That's right. And most big hospitals now will have an acute knee clinic. Um, we certainly had one at St. George's um, in Tooting when I worked there. Um, you know, and that's direct access from A&E. You get to see a knee surgeon, you know, within one or two weeks, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a good way to get into the system. So. You know, I think if you, you know, after listening to all of this, think you've done it, you need to go to A&E. Yeah, yeah. Get in the system. Get in the system. And the other thing, I'm just going to say this now, we would come on to it, but maybe we'll come on. No, let's do it now. Is there an urgency to the operation? Is there an urgency for getting an MRI? Because people will be at home going, I need to get this MRI. Is there, should yeah. they panic? What, what, what should so they I think there's, so there's two things there. Um, there isn't an urgency with the operation, right. um, dependent on the assumption you've not done anything else. So let's just say you've done your ACL. You know there is no urgency with that per se. 
Um, if you've had the injury, then there's no urgency to go out in the next 24 hours and get a scan. Sure. But you ought to be getting a diagnosis within two weeks. Right. Um, and the reason for that is if you've got a really significant meniscal tear as well, that might be the thing that pulls your operation date forwards, um, either just to treat that meniscal tear and then worry about the ACL later, mm. or to do it early, all in one go. Yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. Um, and also, the other thing to mention is exactly just backing up what you said is in that first two weeks, they need to, even if they're going to have an operation at some point, you need to concentrate on getting the swelling down. You need to try and restore a bit of movement if it's not too sore. So there's things that people can be getting on with, isn't there, to even yeah. get ready for what might be the next stage. Yeah, that's right. So, they, you know, the early days of it, getting the movement back, particularly the extension, getting the swelling out of it, um, it's worth its weight in gold yeah. for later. And, um, you know, the last thing you want is, you know, the knee held rigidly stiff and it just stiffens up more. Mm. Um, one of the things that, you know, it's really important before the operation is the knee has to move normally so it matches the other side. Mm. Um, and the reason for that is one of the side effects of having an ACL reconstruction is causing knee stiffness. And yeah. if you operate with the knee stiff to start with, you're more likely to end up with a stiff knee afterwards. Yeah. Um, so, you know, get it moving. And, yeah. um, and also that there is a role, isn't there, that that prehab, so seeing a physio before your surgery to get ready for surgery, which I know you often do to yeah. make sure they're in the best position they can be before, before you go in because they're going to end up with a, as you say, if they've got a stiff knee before, they're having a stiffer knee after, generally speaking. Yeah, that's right. To, to get it back. You know, the other benefits of doing some, what we call it, prehabilitation uh, before surgery is you learn a load of the exercises that are yeah. the same ones you're going to be doing afterwards. Yeah. So um, it's a good idea. You get to see a smiley physio. You yeah. get to see a smiley physio. Um, or me. <laughs> you know, and you know, trying to get a bit of muscle strength yeah. back. You know, it's incredible with a swollen knee how quickly the muscle wastes. So, you know, just trying to prevent any more muscle loss is, you know, really valuable. Absolutely, and particularly well. it's the quadriceps on the front, isn't it, that mm. just seems to just shrivel up within. Mm. Yeah. So, Mike, um, give us your story. What happened with your ACL? In terms of when I injured it and the pathway I took? Yeah, so you've done the injury. Obviously, you've got some knowledge in this area. But, yeah. but we're going to lead into should you have surgery or sure. should you not have surgery? Sure. What's your story and why did you have surgery? Sure. So, I said I injured it and I pretty much knew I'd injured it. I'm, you know, I'm lucky enough to have healthcare, but I knew that if I was going to go through healthcare, you'd have to go through a few steps. So I just went and paid for my own MRI first. Um, again, if I wasn't a physio, I didn't know that. Obviously, I would have gone to see someone first. Um, but I spoke to a friend. He had a quick look. He said, "Yep, yeah, definitely a bit of laxity in there." So had my MRI scan. As soon as it showed the complete, then I booked in with Martin to have the consultation. Um, from that point, I kind of said to Martin, can I have a, you know, a good couple of few months just to get my knee ready for the surgery? Because it was Had you decided stiff. at that point you were definitely having surgery? For, for me, yes, but there is a reason for it in terms of my, my sport and what, I, what I'm going for. Yeah. Um, because it's for me, it's time frame sensitive as well, which is a big thing which we can talk about later, whether it's conservative, non-conservative. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, I wanted to get my knee in good shape first, as, as Martin's alluded to already. And during that process, I thought I'd give myself three months to get it in good shape so I was primed for the surgery. Um, at that stage, also, I knew that if it was feeling good, I could test it a little bit without going back into sport. So I then did a few little dynamic tests, which we can speak about later, and yeah. sport, essentially returned sport testing. Um, and I did fail a couple. A couple my knee did feel quite uncomfortable. I couldn't execute the way that I felt I should. So then I just immediately knew that I was definitely going to go for the surgery. So what's interesting for me there is you. it doesn't sound like you were having instability episode so it wasn't actually giving way no it no. wasn't but it, it felt different as yeah. people say before um and i you know things like catching my foot like when i was talking to my dog for a walk and you know and i caught my foot on something that gave me quite a bit of discomfort whereas right. obviously normally it wouldn't so there were little signs that something wasn't particularly comfortable yeah um but i was trying to not be stupid and kind of do this high impact high intensity stuff because yeah. i knew that with the diagnosis I had, that wasn't a great Was yours idea. just an ACL? Was it, it, it was pretty much isolated, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but like I said, when I when I went through the process, my knee felt like it was in good condition. I did test it, and it didn't really hold up the way I wanted to. So, so how, long after your, well, how long after the injury was the surgery? Um, just less than three months. Three months. Yeah, about Perfect. three months. And we'll come on to how it went sure. 
I'm assuming it went well as you're still both <laughs> speaking to each other. Um, so Martin, somebody sitting at home, they've done their ACL, they've got their MRI. What are their options? What yeah, is the best good. option? So, so there isn't a gold standard answer to that. Um, there's two really clear options. Um, one is a non-operative pathway, and then the other is the surgical pathway. And we, we talked earlier about this functional instability versus laxity. So the days are gone where just a lax knee, when you examine it, equates to must have an operation. Um, and most knee surgeons now are, are, are much more selective with um, who needs ACL recon. Now there will always be lots of patients and it's obvious from the first time you meet them and examine their knee and hear their story and hear what the knee does that you know they're going to need the operation. Mm. Um, you know, Mike was certainly one of those and you know, I remember one of his drivers was that this knee felt different to the partial rupture. And I even know. though it wasn't giving way every day, he wasn't doing anything on it, um, but it didn't feel right. Um, and it felt different to the other side. Um, so, you know, we obviously made the, the, the decision then that, you know, a surgical pathway was the, was the best way to go. But patients who don't have functional instability, so their knee's not giving way on them. Um, and, and doesn't feel unstable or they, they're quite comfortable in it. Yeah, so, so it doesn't have to actually give way and twist out in the same way that it did on the day of injury. Um, it, a lot of patients will say, I just don't trust it. Um, and what they mean by that is they, you know, they're, they're changing direction on public transport and it just doesn't feel right. And they don't want to put much pressure on it. And, you know, they know that, you know, if they went back to sport and had to cut or pivot or land, you know, they wouldn't want to put the joint through that. Um, but patients that don't have any of those symptoms, um, and there are a number, um, a trial of non-operative treatment um, to get the muscle stronger and also to improve how the muscle fires can compensate for not having an ACL and can get them back to their pre-injury level of sport. Mm. Now, you know, that's on the assumption that they've not got anything else going on in there. Yeah. You know, if you've so got no a, meniscal, no tear, meniscal no, tear, no joint yeah. surface damage that would need an operation anyway. So, you know, just an ACL, um, no instability, then a, a non-operative pathway um, is a really good way to start. And that will either work and they will do better and better, get their trust back in the joint and then yeah. return to their pre-injury level of sport. Or during that rehab, as the exercises get more complex and they're landing, jumping, hopping, they will not be able to do it. Then they can enter the surgical pathway then if they want. Yeah, so there's no rush, is there? You can trial that conservative treatment. Mm. Unless the knee is just giving way, mm. that then, then yeah. potentially you're damaging the joint and long-term which we'll talk about in a minute, is not necessarily a, a, a good thing. Mm. Just going back, what about the partial ACL and the sprains before we go full on onto the... Mm. Yeah. So, so sprains are really rare. Um, you know, if there's enough force to damage the ACL, it will normally fully rupture it. So we don't see many, uh, but the sprains are normally treated in a knee brace, um, then with neuromuscular training. Um, and there's a, there's a, a very quick return um, you know, eight to 12 weeks after injury to full sport, you know, once they've been through testing to, to prove that their strength is equal in both legs and their neuromuscular reflexes are back. Yeah. Um, the partial tears would go through the non-operative pathway, assuming they didn't them have... for a bit or not? No, no. The, the, the bracing for those, because there's, you know, nothing to heal if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It just causes more muscle wasting. So we actually want the opposite of that. Um, and some partial tears um, will need an operation. So some patients won't cope with a single bundle intact. So that it can still give way. That's absolutely yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, and we, you know, when we when we operate on these, um, you know, cases and we look inside the knee for the for the first time at the operation, you will often find that only one of the bundles has gone. So right. just having a partial doesn't necessarily mean you've got away with it. Yeah. You know, you may well still have, you know, a significant injury. Um, Do you ever get an MRI and it's been called a partial? But actually, when you go in, there's not a lot going. On. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, it, do we, how accurate is the MRI? That's the question. Yeah. So, so, so the MRI is is very accurate. Um, what I think you are talking about is how accurate is the report. Okay, so, fair enough. Yeah. You know, anyone listening who has their uh, has an injury and gets an MRI scan, you want to go through that scan with your surgeon. Yeah. Um, you know, your surgeon shouldn't just be reading the report. 
Um, the surgeon needs to be able to read that scan themselves and then interpret that scan and relate those findings to your examination on the table and the plan for surgery. Um, That's a very important point because these days you can self-refer for an MRI scan. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, I'm sure, are coming into your clinic with a report, but they need those images, they need the disc, they need the it's they correct. need to give you access for yeah. you to give the full information. That's to, right. Yeah. And I think there's the other patients who you just know from the start are not going to be on this non-operative pathway. So so younger age patients, you know, an 18-year-old that's done it playing netball and wants to go back to netball, it's obvious that they're going to need the ACL reconstruction doing. Yeah. Um, you know, younger patients, you know, want to go back to their pre-injury sport and high level twisting cutting sports you know netball martial art soccer basketball you know they're going to need an acl reconstruction unless they're going to change their level of sport yeah yeah um so it's quite a complicated process working out which pathway people should be on um and people often change pathway yeah yeah which is fine really isn't it which is fine but they do need the right information because at the end of the day to a certain extent it well no not to a certain extent it is going to be their decision at the end of the day we just or you just have to provide that information and talk it through with them. Mm. But as you say, it's a, it can be quite difficult to make. And actually, we've seen patients that are quite anxious about whether they're doing the right thing. Um, but often that's probably because they haven't actually had the time with their surgeon or physio to talk through, mm. talk through the process. Um, so in terms of the conservative treatment, Mike, we'll come to you. I know you had it operated on Mm -hmm. but just from a physio point of Mm -hmm. view what does that look like if you're if you opt for the non-surgical option sure i mean it follows a relatively similarish pathway to the pot to the surgical process because you're essentially looking to do the exact same thing you're looking to protect the knee as much as possible and get it to a mechanical position where it can do everything it should have done with a fully functional acl anyway so again you're looking for the management first trying to get on top of the swelling restore muscle function range of movement then you'd be looking at trying to get that increased strength training to really load at the muscles and and pick it up then we'll look at the neuromuscular aspect of it which which martin was talking to before which is mostly kind of landing mechanics your ability to control the proprioceptive element of the knee and then the return sport testing just the time frames generally a little bit a little bit shorter yeah a little bit shorter It's it's certainly not something that can be rehabbed off a sheet of paper, isn't no, it? No, and it's not It's not in weeks either, it's months. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people think, oh, just partial, that'll be great, go conservative three, you know, two, three months, I'll be back. Um, yeah. Still still quite a big injury. Yeah, absolutely. And to um, get, we know to gain muscle, certainly to gain bulk does take... Takes time. Yeah, you know, it takes yeah. months, doesn't it? it does. So it's, it's going to be months. And then as Martin said, along the way, when you start testing their jumping, yeah. their, their landing mechanics, yeah. they may then experience at that point... 100% that they feel they need to then change pathway because they're getting that sensation of instability. The, but I think it's important that people know they haven't just wasted their time. No, absolutely. Because they're going to get the muscle, they're going into the operation in a really good state then, It's what they? I did what I did. Yeah. Because I knew it would be easier for me coming out the other side. Yeah. Um, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Perfect. So this is an area, Martin, we talked about before the podcast and um, there seems to be quite a lot, that, I mean, it's been a lot on the social on social media and that sort of thing that there's a new study that's come out and it leads us on to our next question is, can the ACL heal if you've completely ruptured it? One study has suggested that over 50% of them heal, which I think we were all quite shocked about when we read that. What was your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, this has been researched for, for many years now and the ACL can tear in different places. And there are other things that can happen to the ACL once it's torn. So, for example, it can heal to one of the other ligaments in the knee or it can heal to a different place in the knee distinct from where it tore from. Um, And that's going to give the ACL or the remaining ACL some function. So I, I don't think there's good research evidence that suggests that the ACL will definitely just heal back to each other but one of the torn portions can heal to another structure in the knee that will give some support. Um, And the study showed that in young patients, um, that was unlikely to happen. Um, In middle-aged patients with a particular type of rupture where it ruptures high up the ACL, or we would call that a proximal rupture, that it can heal to one of the other ligaments. Which would be ACL which would be the PCL or to a different place. Um, in, in my experience of it, um, I see a lot of skiers in the winter that do this, and middle-aged female skiers 
um, where that's their main sport apart from gym work. So they're not team ball sports. Yeah. Um, they might be racket sport to a recreational level, but they ski a couple of times a year. They often have proximal ruptures. Right. Um, and it's amazing the number that have some stability afterwards because it's healed to something else. I've, I had a, a lady recently, she ruptured it about three weeks later. It was almost like a normal knee, no mm. giving way, swelling to come down. And the rehab was just so easy. Mm. And we don't know, but my impression was that maybe she, she was exactly that category. Mm. She's gone back skiing, kite surfing and, mm. and everything. Mm. But I think fundamentally that paper hasn't changed the algorithm or the, the management anyway, hasn't it? Because you're going to speak to people about both options anyway, aren't you? I think so. And I think the the weight of evidence for hamstring ACL reconstruction or patellar tendon reconstruction, we've got good 25, 30 year outcome data on that. Mm. Um, and that's what most knee surgeons will be following. Yeah. Um, absolutely, you know, new ideas and, you know, biologics that might help healing of your ACL without an operation. Those are all good research topics. Yeah. But the amount of research that's available at the moment to make that preferable to what we already know, it, it's not there yet. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so let's go, I'll go on to this question now because it's part of the decision making as to whether or not you should have a reconstruction or not. If you're thinking about the long-term health of your knee, we get this a lot. If I don't get this fixed now, I'm gonna have arthritis when I'm older. Can you talk to us about what the current trend is around if you have the ACL reconstruction or not, the health of your knee as you get older. Because mm. I think that does influence people's or potentially could influence their decision making. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, the, the mean age for this injury is 29. And these patients are, you know, fit, active, play a lot of sport. They want to be doing that well into their 40s. Mm. You know, they're concerned quite rightly yeah. that it may limit their sporting activity you know, in one or two decades time. So um, so we would all like to think that reconstructing the ACL prevents progression of arthritis in the future. Yeah. But there's lots and lots of good quality research data um, that shows that non-operative treatment versus having an ACL reconstruction makes no difference to your yeah. risk of arthritis in the future. Because the so, key thing is if you've done the injury, that is the risk, isn't it? It is. It's, it's that having, initial it, it, trauma. It's the initial trauma and... Um, reconstructing it sadly doesn't seem to to change or protect against getting the arthritis. Mm -hmm. Now the thing that will change the risk of developing arthritis is meniscal injury. Um, we've already said with that that if you have further pivot episodes that damage the menisci that are normal the day you tear your ACL then absolutely that's going to increase the risk of arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, the risk of arthritis overall is about 20% 20 years after the injury. Right. So one in five people, 20 years afterwards, will have a degree of arthritis. Whether they've had it reconstructed yeah. or not. And, and, and the key thing with that is, you know, whether that's symptomatic arthritis, yeah. where the patient will actually have symptoms from that, or whether it's just findings that are picked up on x-rays. Yeah. So a lot of the studies on all of this have looked at x-ray changes, where you might see the joint is becoming arthritic, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those patients are going to have symptoms from it, or they're going to be limited in what their functional sporting activity is going to be. Yeah. So there's quite a lot to consider there, isn't it? But fundamentally, the art, what we're saying is the argument for having the reconstruction done is not one for the long term health. That's absolutely the right. And yeah. the, you know, the other two factors that can influence development of arthritis after ACL is high body mass index. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's linked as well to just general arthritis as we all get older, irrespective of injury. Um, and, you know, high impact sports. So, you know, running for cardio, for example, yeah. you know, which is 10 to 12 times body weight through the joint. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's more body weight than cycling, swimming, gym work, martial arts. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So load across the a lot joint. Of work. A lot of, lot of impact on that joint, isn't it? Mm. So let's say that we're going to come on to the surgery, but let's say for whatever reason we've decided, well, like Mike, like you did, decided to have an operation done. Mm. If somebody's at home preparing for surgery or they've yeah. made that decision, have you got, you know, from somebody that's been through it, have you got any tips in terms of 
How much time are you going to need off work? When sure. do you get back? How long does it take? Any sure. And again, it's all slightly different for everyone, but there yeah. are some kind of rough time frames that, that I, would, I would give most people. Most of the time I'd say, if you've got an office desk pace job, two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks is enough generally just to get on top of most of the pain and the swelling so you can be more comfortable going back to work. A more physical manual job, possibly four to six weeks. Um, again, just to just to, even the pain of just the surgery itself is enough to kind of yeah. take it off, and you want to give it time to settle, so then you can actually get around and feel comfortable with that. A um, couple of things that I think are really important for the knee early doors is stuff like a really good icing and compression system. I find really really useful. I mean, I, I had the game ready personally, but there's some really good products out there yeah. that can really help get on top of your pain and your swelling, which means you can get you know do more rehab quicker, return to better function quicker. The other thing I'm quite a big fan of is a neuromuscular stimulator um, because, again, we know that after the operation, you can't contract the thigh as much as you'd like to. The brain kind of switches it off a little bit to protect the knee, but that also delays your ability to get stronger, do more rehab and walk around. So the two kind of adjuncts I think are really quite useful yeah. um, and definitely helped quicken up my process. Yeah. And were you um, on crutches straight after? I was given crutches straight after. I used them for a couple of days and I felt I was quite comfortable to walk with a quite a normal walking pattern after. But again, that is completely kind of function and symptom driven yeah. in terms of how long to use crutches for. Because um, we don't want them damaging the knee, but equally you want to be using the muscles in the leg as well as the hip and the ankle to kind of give you that normal walking pattern as much as possible. Yeah, perfect. Um, in terms of rough time frames for most things. How long did it take you? To do what? To get back to <laughs> um, playing sports. So I'm eight months now. So well, coming up to eight months now. So I'm back training with sports teams. I'm doing all the training. Um, I'm going to wait until at least nine months until I get back into the full blown stuff. Yeah. Um, again, speaking to Martin, we can talk about it later in terms of percentages of, of, of you know, re-injury and re-ruptures. There's a lot yeah. of evidence show that after nine months, there's a much lower rate of re-injury. Yeah. Um, so for that reason, I'd much rather wait those extra month or two and give myself every opportunity of having a better outcome. Don't um, rush it unless you... No, you, but, you, but again... You since, get paid 110 yeah, grand a week. exactly. Yeah. So six, six months I've been back doing sport-related activity with my club, obviously non-contact, nothing yeah. fully paced. Yeah. And, and to be completely honest, it's felt absolutely normal since that six-month mark. Hmm. Um, but... You know, functionally it can feel great, but we know biologically maybe not quite as stable as I'd like yeah. it to be. So that's why I'm just going to give it that extra bit yeah, of time. Absolutely. So the key thing after the operation for anybody yep. that's had one done, we would say is get the because it's going to be swollen after and that is be normal, yeah. and it's going to be painful. So icing it, elevating it, yep. trying to get that swelling down yep. is a priority in the first yes. few weeks, definitely. And it? little bit and often, especially in the first two weeks. I say the same to everyone, do little bits and often. If yeah. you just try and do all your rehab in one big go, you're probably going to suffer a bit it's because quite tiring of as well. It's incredibly a big tiring. operration as well. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you've got to recover from the anesthetics, yeah, you know, yeah. which takes a good few days to kind of yeah. clear out from you. Your tissues having to recover, which takes up a lot of energy. Yeah. It's exhausting. And then from a, you were saying neuromuscular, so something like a complex machine, there's lots yep. of other options, yep. isn't there? Yep. Red dots, blue dots. Power dots. Um, but yep. Power dots. Getting, getting the muscle to activate afterwards yes. is really important. I think the main reason for that is you need your quad to activate because we want to get full extension exactly right. within two weeks, really, don't we? we mm. don't, otherwise, the risk is... And that's that is the the worst risk as a surgeon, isn't it? Is that they come back to see you and they've got a stiff knee. Mm. We just don't want that. And then maybe at four weeks you're starting to get, you know, night or good knee flexion, maybe ninety degrees, maybe yeah, a little I mean, bit more. What what are you your know, my little landmarks are? You know, they should have full extension almost straight away after surgery. Um, and if the graft's been put in an isometric position in the right place, then they should be able to to fully extend. Um, my landmarks for flexion are 90 degrees by two weeks and then 120 degrees by six weeks, by six weeks yeah. um, depending on any restrictions that the meniscal work, you know, might limit the amount of flexion. So it will depend. Um, That's yeah. probably an important message is it will depend on on specifically what surgery is being done. That's right. And the surgeon will take you through that, yeah. won't they? Yeah, and that's, um, you know, another really important thing that, you know, each patient's um, bespoke rehab program reflects their age the graft type how the acl has been mm -hmm. fixed and what other surgery has been done you know there isn't a sort of standard no and you'll mm -hmm. find lots of different things online as well won't you so yeah. i think we have to be cautious and one of the you know one of the you much. know sort of really common sort of genuine mistakes patients make is you know after the first few days and it's not really sore mm. they stop all the painkillers mm -hmm. 
but then they can't do the physio exercises because it hurts to bend it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they come back and, you know, and say, well, well, it, it didn't hurt. I didn't take anything, but you know, they've, you know, not quite, you know, got it bending in time. Yeah. So, you know, so we tell them before, you know, you've got to take the painkillers to let you do the rehab exercises. Mm. Yeah. And I think from a, obviously as a, as physios and people that run a physio clinic, there is a massive role for physio in that first, you know, in that first phase, isn't there? Mm. It's not a question of, well, I've had an operation, I'll give it a couple of weeks to settle it down. Because although, yes, we want it to settle down, you've you've got to start your exercises yeah. pretty much day one. Well, as so. Martin says, if you can get full extension, it looks good at two weeks, really your onward pathway looks a hell of a lot healthier yeah. and a lot quicker and it's so much easier. Yeah. Um, if you're really struggling, still trying to regain range at three, four, five weeks and you haven't got full extension, mm. then you can't even do the next phase of rehab yeah. anyway because if you can't lock in it, you can't go on and do the next phase because you know yes we do have these time frames but also it's got to be function and symptom driven mm. and if you can't get full extension there's a huge amount i wouldn't really ask a lot of people to do going forward because they're lacking the yeah. basic function you've, of you've the got knee. to get that that is you've your priority to. isn't it Absolutely. from a physio point of view yeah. um and if you get it as you say it generally is quite yeah. straightforward yeah things roll these things yeah things roll. the other thing is from a physio point of view is you do need to see a physio that sees lots of acl reconstructions Ideally. not not you know because yeah. that experience is very important yeah. because you have to push people as well, don't you? Absolutely. And it takes a confident physio to say, no, come on. Yeah. And you also know, it takes, ex moving. yeah. And it takes experience or if you've had one yourself, it's even better yeah, yeah. because you can explain why things hurt and why that's okay. Yeah. Because if they get a pain and they panic about it, but you say, actually, this is normal and this is why, and that's okay. Mm. Then generally they'll push and, and they feel comfortable with that. Or conversely say, if this hurts, when you do that, yeah, that's yeah. a problem. Then they have you know, a leeway of what's yeah. okay, what's not okay. Yeah. Um, and people get concerned, oh, I'm going to snap my ACL. Absolutely. Yeah, How I, strong is it, Martin, in those first, in that first month? So it, it is strong. And um, with normal walking forces across the ACL, um, the force is very, very little, um, mm -hmm. just with normal walking. Um, but the first six weeks is really important because during that time, the ACL or the graft that you've used is being held in by either screws or a button. And it's during that first six weeks that the bone is then growing around the new ACL to hold it in place. Um, and you can get stretching of the graft as it slips against the screws. Um, and, and that is a risk in the first six weeks. So we want little forces across it during that time. But, you know, you'd have to have... Well, the a, four, what, what would be the things that you would want to avoid then in that first six weeks to avoid that? So anything twisting or turning, yeah. um, you've, you've just got to be really sensible. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you don't I, want to be slipping in the yeah. shower. It's those sorts of things that... As, as Mike says, you know, you shouldn't be using public transport for the first two or three weeks because yeah. it's just a, a, bit a dangerous. It's a ringer for having yeah. a problem. You know, the tube suddenly yeah. stops and you... That's when you should you know, have your crutches, isn't it? That's when you should well, have your crutches. Yeah. And, you know, there is some evidence now for bracing people for six weeks just to make sure the graft doesn't slip. You know, that seems to have all come back, but... You know, you know how you wouldn't routinely brace. That's a good question. No, but I, I do now. Oh, interesting. Um, purely for that reason. And, and what's the brace look like? And is it locked in at certain? Yeah, so so it's like you know, it's like the ones you see people in the, in the street wearing. Yeah, yeah, it's got yeah. a hinge at the knee. Yeah. Um, for the first two weeks, it can bend up to sixty degrees. So naught to sixty. Yeah. Or, yeah, and then for another month, um, you know, right up to ninety degrees, and you know, it's good for confidence. You know, they mm. they don't need to sleep in it. They can take it off in the house. Just a bit of um, protection. But you know, but you want to make sure that doesn't put them off bending it, hence they need to keep doing is. those exercises. Yeah, and that's, you know, why, you know, you need a physio that does lots of ACL work yeah. to be able to say to them, look, you know, you can take it off, it's all fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really important. So you've talked about graphs there, Martin. There is I think there's less controversy around this now, but certainly back in the day, it was like, because everybody was doing a patella tendon graft, mm. you know, 15, 20 years ago, everybody seems to now do a hamstring graft. Uh, there's a few other options, isn't there? Do mm. you want to just run us through where we are with that? I believe yours was a hamstring. Hamstring graft. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so so when, when the particular way we do the operation now, so keyhole ACL was, you know, designed in the early 1990s, it was a race to find which graft source mm. would be the best one to use. And the, the two runners, it, it's like the politics, the two runners were the bone, patella tendon, bone. Yeah. So taking a strip of your patella tendon uh, that runs down from the front of the kneecap to the shin or using your hamstring tendons, which um, come from the back of the knee. Um, and they're both really good graft sources. Yeah. 
So the rupture rate between the two or the re-rupture rate is no difference between them. Um, patella tendon graft has some benefits that it has bone attached to each end of it. So when you fix it in place, you've got bone to bone healing. Whereas with a hamstring, you've got hamstring to bone healing. Um, and bone to bone is a, a very strong way of fixing something by the same mechanisms that our body can heal um, a, a broken bone. Um, and it's an individual uh, decision for the patient. Um, one of the potential problems originally with patella tendon graft was it caused pain across the front of the knee. Uh, but harvesting techniques um, have got more elegant and that seems to reduce that risk. Um, there is an, a higher risk of getting arthritis. There um, is a higher. With patella, a patella tendon. tendon. Interesting, I didn't know that. Um, but again, is that something that's symptomatic or is that something which uh, is just seen on an x-ray? Yeah. You know, the studies really, you know, look at x-ray changes rather than, you know, dropping Whether function or, pain. Yeah, or yeah. symptoms. But, but in this country, to put some numbers on it, you know, 80 odd percent our hamstring. Would that be the same for your practice? Yeah, it would. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and but but bone patella tendon has had a bit of a comeback. And there are some specific groups where uh, patella tendon is better. Um, and that's elite sport like premiership football. Um, there's a reduced rupture rate with uh, patella tendon. Interestingly, in elite rugby, there's a reduced rupture rate with hamstring. Right. So that's yeah. why Mike had um, yeah. a hamstring graft. I had a hamstring graft, yeah. um, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's been great. And they're doing quadriceps graft sometimes? Yeah, so, so quads is a new graft yeah. um, that's been around maybe for five or six years. Um, there was some early data that suggested it had a higher rupture rate right. than the other two. Um, there's some newer studies that perhaps show that might not be the case. Um the other two options are using something called an allograft, um, which is a dead person's tendon, mm -hmm. um, which has all been sterilized and cleaned. Um, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it's, um, that's very common in the US. Yeah. Um, it's not common in the UK. Um, that absolutely is associated with a higher re-rupture rate, um, often because the collagen fibers are damaged with the way the tendon is sterilized um, right. before it's used. Um, and then the final one is using an artificial graft. Um, so that was very popular 20 odd years ago. Um, and thankfully now that is almost um, extinct. Um, those types of graft cause lots of problems inside the joint with inflammation um, or synovitis where the body recognized in the joint that there was foreign artificial material in there and, and caused a big, it. and attacks it, yeah, yeah. causes a big inflammatory response. and. I remember when I was training in Australia, seeing lots of cases that had, you know, had these artificial grafts and the, you know, the inside of the knee is all red and angry and there's a high yeah, failure yeah. rate and the we don't patient, want that. patients went back to sport too early and, you know, all mm. of that stuff. So, so for this country, most patients will have um, a, a hamstring mm. and, um, you know, the donor will be the patient. Yeah. So, Mike, you had a hamstring. Yep. So did you, Martin. Um, one thing that people will say, well, if you take my hamstring graft, am I going to have hamstring tears after? Sure. Is, what, what's your thoughts around that? Um, don't really see it that often. What, what I do find is people don't focus enough on their hamstrings. To be honest, and I'm sure you probably see the same. I see a lot of deficient hamstrings that aren't as strong, but I'm not. I haven't seen anyone actually. I don't no. think in the past ten years who's had a hamstring tear or a hamstring rupture yeah. post hamstring graft ACL. So I, I definitely, I definitely remember within when I was working in the NHS, I saw a few hamstrings right. that did tear in that first sort of three, four weeks, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen any for ages. So no, I don't I know haven't. if that's the way these things are grafted. Have you got any opinions yeah, so, on that? So the numbers around all of that, one in 10 of them will have some pain in the hamstrings at about six weeks after sure, surgery. Which I did. And they'll sort of, you know, they'll, they'll gradually get better from the harvest. And then at about six or seven weeks, possibly because they're doing a little bit more, yeah, yeah. they suddenly get this thigh pain. But it just always settles with slowing the rehab down, doing some stretches, taking an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Um, but long term, taking the hamstring graft has no long term deficits mm. on the power in the leg, mm -hmm. um, apart from some unique groups of sporting patients. Right. So elite uh, rowers, right. for example, need that forced extension yeah. um, and elite sprinters. So, so you might actually on. avoid, absolutely, or maybe a footballer that's 
had 10 hamstring tears, would, would that influence whether yeah. you take it or not? So elite, the, the evidence would be patella tendon for oh, those anyway. Yeah. Um, but previous hamstring, you know, tears, um, you know, it's unusual, uh, but that wouldn't potentially stop you taking no, sure. two of yeah, the yeah. tendons. And, you know, just remember the, you know, you're only taking two hamstring tendons, you know, there's plenty left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, only taking a small part of it, aren't you? Mm. Let's just talk about this. So some people uh, might be watching this going, hang on, this is a ligament and you're taking a tendon. Mm. Can you talk us through mm. why that is the case? So Why don't you take a ligament? Yeah, so, so so we can't really take a ligament because you haven't really got one that we can take one. without some problems. Yeah. Whereas, you know, luckily there's lots of tendons that you can afford to lose, um, you know, without causing any trouble. So it's part of the reason that I'm glad Mike hasn't gone back to sport yet at eight months, um, allegedly, um, because because uh, the, the tendon that we've put into him is going through a process called ligamentization. And what that means is that over the first nine months, the actual tendon fibers are being converted into a ligament. Now we have no idea how that actually happens. Um, and the studies have been done in animals where the animals have had an ACR reconstruction using a tendon and then the tendons have been biopsied along the way. Um, and histologically under the microscope, it's actually ligament tissue. Um, so it definitely changes. It definitely changes to um, a ligament tissue. The minimum time is nine months. Um, but probably for it fully to happen would be between 12 and 24 months. And so that is part of your reasoning for not rushing it, maybe being at that nine months before you go back. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, I suppose... And I think a, there's clear evidence to support that, that Mike alluded to, is that the longer you leave it, almost the better? Or Yeah, so if you, if you leave it beyond nine months, you cut your chance of doing it again by about 51%, 52%. I mean, that's really key information. It's really, really it? key. So basically, anybody that's listening, don't rush it. Mm. It doesn't matter how fit you are. If you can wait nine months wait because of and this it's process. true and, and that process of ligamentization is distinct from the rehabilitation where the harder you work the quicker mm. you get your skeletal muscle mass up and the quicker you get your range back and improve your neuromuscular reflexes the ligamentization rate is the same in a client who does no rehab versus a client that's working hard like mike it you know it's a glacial pace yeah, yeah. Uh, but no one's going to wait 24 months before they go back no. um, younger patients under 25 it's a year because so, of the the greater risk, of yeah. The because the greater risk of, of doing it again, anyway. Um, if you're under eighteen, your risk of doing it again is five times. So wow. it's a huge risk of doing it again. So, so more so in girls and boys, though. More so in boys with a hamstring. Oh, so males have a higher graft rupture rate with hamstring, um, and males with BTB. So it's between four and five Just times with hamstring, about four times with patella. Mm. I mean, th those stats are actually really useful. I know everybody's different, but they are really useful to give people an overall idea of what almost what they've got, not what they've got themselves into, but mm. also the situation they're in. And mm. it, it, it is a process that you have to respect. As you say, it doesn't matter if you've got the strongest quad in the world, although we believe that's really important. You can't actually change the way this tendon goes into a ligament i think that's a really key thing because everybody we see is what can i do to speed this up well you can do all this great stuff but actually there is a process mm. that's occurring that we can't actually influence mm. so i think that's really important um so let's just skip along uh to the sort of last bit that i want to cover mm. is return to sport so we've already i think that's really important what we've talked about but from a surgeon's point of view, we'll start with the surgeon, then we'll go on to the physio. From a surgeon's point of view, when can somebody go back to sport? So first of all, the ligamentization process beyond nine months for you know, average age patients in their late 20s and 30s, 12 months for um, younger patients. Um, and then the next thing is, you know, in, in, in no particular order, correction of strength deficit. So they should have the same strength in the operated leg as the unoperated. Um, and as a general guide, they should be able to single leg press their body weight um, as, a, a, as yeah. a rough rule. Yeah. Um, and then the neuromuscular reflexes, and that's how quickly the muscle fires, they should be back to normal. So the injury and the surgery will both make those reflexes very sluggish. 
um, and uh, Mike may be uh, able to explain this, um, you know, better than me. Uh, but what that means is, you know, when someone lands or, or jumps during a team ball sport, it's how quickly that muscle fires on landing to stop that knee pivoting out. Um, you obviously want those reflexes back to normal. Um, and there's, there's various ways we can test them. Um, there's really good research evidence now that patients who complete a testing program after they've had their ACR rehab and pass it, they have a lower re-rupture rate than patients that don't go through a formal program to test it. Um, so I, th I think it is important. And, you know, I, I see all the patients at nine months, you know, with the results of that testing so that we can make sure they've done it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's no shame in taking a bit longer. No. Absolutely. You know, life events happen. You know, you know, we saw a lot of it during COVID mm. when, you know, it was harder to access physio. Um, and those patients just lost out on that time and had to pick it up afterwards. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And from a physio point of view, Mike? Yeah. No, I, I agree, especially the neurovascular side. Um, really important. Again, I like to call it motor programming sometimes. And that's just your ability to automatically produce a movement that is desirable and again that has to happen over time that's the sequencing of when the muscles react and again because it's always so quick it has to be drilled and has to be repetitive so really the rehab especially that six to nine months has to include all of those desired movement patterns like landing cutting change of direction pivoting you have to go through the process and understand technically how it should look like so that if you need to you can call on it instantly yeah. um, and i have my own little protocol i always do and i'll test and retest everyone before they go back into the sport and i have metrics that i look for every time um that, it, that incorporates all of those aspects into I think it's terms important of strength what, and control and movement patterning and all that kind of absolutely. stuff i think it's important what you've said there as well we know injury risks are higher when you go into a competitive basically when you go into a match yes. yeah and so you you may return to some of the sport mm -hmm. but you still need a good period of time where you're training yes. before you're competing. hundred percent, yeah. Uh, normally from six, between the six and nine month period, but again, that is all dependent on what exactly the knee looks like functionally and symptomatically. Yeah. But you should have a, at least a few months of going through the same move patterns in a more controlled environment and building yeah. it progressively. Um, a, because then you're gonna have the confidence to know you can do it, and B, again, the re-injury rate we know is much, much lower. Yeah. Um, because unfortunately, the, the statistics, if you look at them, of people going back in sport after ACL is quite poor, actually. You know, yeah, study the same about sixty five percent of patients go back to the same level as they were pre, and I think mm. a huge amount of that is to do with the poor rehab um, and their lack of confidence to go and do those same movement patterns that created the injury in the first place. Yeah, but no, if you I can agree, go through yeah. the you know the return sport testing, not only is it good for me to see they can do it, but it proves to the patient also that actually their knee is functionally very mm. capable, and which means they're much more likely to pick up. Yeah, yeah. where they want to go to. And, and I think what we've, we've alluded to it before, but one of the key things is that you see somebody that knows how to do a yes. good return to sport. Yes. Because there's no one test, is there? No. There's a barrage of tests yes. that we're going to use on you to find out, for example, if you're strong enough, are you, are, are, is your balance good enough? Is your stability yeah. good enough? Is your jumping good enough? All of these things. And then if it's football you've got to do, you've got to then incorporate it's, the football. I was going to say it's massively sport specific, you know, because as Martin said, I see a huge amount of netball players. And my return sport testing, although some of the baseline parameters between them and someone playing rugby, for example, is the same. There's a huge amount of separate things that I would look at also. Yeah. Um, because it's got to be individualised, tailored yeah, to that person. Yeah, sport specific is really, really yeah. key um, because th there are forces that a netball player is going to go through that's much harder than a rugby player mm. and then vice versa. Mm. So it shouldn't just be the same generic testing on every single patient. It has to be sport specific. And if you're unsure, then ask. I've had patients before who do something slightly rogue and I've said to them, can you bring in you know, a video so I yeah. can see the kind of mechanics you need to go through, then we can break it down and build you up for that six to nine months. Like yeah. if they're gonna do parkour or something. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a I'm not a specialist no. at parkour. No. But if you can see what they do and the basic movement patterns need to be good at, at least you can then tailor it to them. Yeah. Because they're different to football or rugby or yeah. netball. So it's really important you can understand the demands of of your athlete or your patient. Yeah, I think that's really important. And the other thing is if a patient doesn't feel ready, they're yeah. not ready. hundred percent So is although everything. we've got all these nice tests it's always going to come back to the patient Absolutely. how confident and there's there is good research to show that if they feel confident yep. they're less likely to, to yes re -rupture. exactly and that's why it has to be sport specific so you can demonstrate to them and they can understand that they can execute what they need to execute yeah. if it's just been too generic and then they have to do this this specific movement pattern they haven't ever practiced yeah. they're not going to feel confident yeah. And then if you don't commit to some of these higher, you know, more difficult movement patterns, you're more likely to have a problem also. Yeah. So I also think just thinking about the patients that we see with Martin, 
is it, you do need that team around you. Absolutely. So you need to be able to speak to the surgeon when things are going well or things are not going so well. And I'm sure it's the same vice versa, but also you've got the patient. So you've got a team that, and at the end of the day, you're all going to help to make that decision, aren't That's you? Right. Yeah. Um, so the other thing, and I've just thought of this. So just one last question, racing. Mm. I know you're a very... I don't know if you're a good skier, Martin, but you go skiing a lot, so I'm sure you're very good. But um, certainly in the areas that we work, there seems to be a lot of people that go mm. in skiing. What is your thoughts on bracing for skiing, but the principles are probably similar in lots of different sports? Mm. Uh, when would you, when wouldn't you? What's your general line on, on that? And then we can wrap it up there. So I think in a nutshell, the braces have got a lot more advanced in recent years. So particularly with skiing, it, it's quite difficult to get a knee brace to fit with a ski boot on mm -hmm. uh, because the ski boot goes high enough off the calf that there's not a lot of space left sure. to, to fit a brace. So, so if a, a patient has done their rehab to a satisfactory level, done a return to play uh, test, um, done a, a psychometric analysis, um, done an injury prevention program, then they don't need to wear a brace for sure. skiing. Um, there's some good studies from the US that have looked at the US ski team, that wearing a knee brace can cut the risk of further knee injuries, not just ACL, uh, but meniscal As preventative. As, as preventative. Um, so I think there is some evidence there now that some of the newer sports braces um, can help. Um, I offer them to patients who have low confidence with a return to ski. Um, so they may say, you know, Martin, you know, I'm definitely not skiing again. Mm. You know, and of course, being yeah, a skier, yeah. you yeah. know, I tell them, well, that isn't necessarily the way it needs to be. Sure. You know, we can get yeah. you back if you want to. If you love doing um, it, if, if you love doing it, or operation, you, you, then... you want to go with the family. So for yeah. them, a brace is great. Mm. Um, you know, but I, I'm not sure that, you know, with the forces to tear that ACL, that it's, mm. it's going to stop it. Um, there's little evidence for wearing braces in other sports. Mm. Um, you know, it simply isn't going to be enough to counteract the forces, yeah. you know, as you land and pivot. Sure. Uh, but there is some evidence for skiers. Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, that brings us to, to an end. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Not that good Are you looking of. forward to your first... Um... Just over a month away, so I can't I'm wait. Terrified. Yeah. <laughs> terrified, yeah. no, I'm terrified. Martin's terrified, yeah. No, I can't um, wait. No, that's good Got stuff. I'm pleased to hear it went well. I'm not sure we'd have done this if it hadn't gone well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we would have. Anyway, so thanks very much, Martin, for Pleasure. coming. That was a really good insight, uh, very clearly presented. I'm sure that's going to give a lot of people a lot of information, but also hopefully some questions you know, to ask their surgeon or their physio. And hopefully it will help to put some of those decisions around whether you should have a reconstruction or not into some sort of context um, and it's not an easy one, as you say. So the more information a patient can gain about the pros and cons, I think the better. But at the same time, I think it's really important that people don't just Google it because there's lots of information that isn't true, lots of conflicting ideas, and it's important that you get the information off um, somebody that knows what they're talking about. And Mike, thank you very much. Good luck with your recovery. You. And I'm sure if anybody has any questions, I'm sure you can get hold of us and drop us an email. Um, but if you are about to have an ACL reconstruction, then good luck with it. Thanks, guys.